Hello there. Come here, my little friend. Don't be afraid. Hi, welcome back to Star Wars in a Galaxy, watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. I'm Eli. Jacob, unfortunately, cannot be with me um, for this episode. Um, this is our retrospective episode. I do have his thoughts. He texted me all of his thoughts. Um, he's very sad that he can't be here for this occasion, but he did, he did send me his thoughts, um, and, um, I'm gonna go through this retrospective like a normal retrospective episode, and instead of our one quarter portion day, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna tell everybody of our listeners what's exactly happening, uh, this, going into later in the summer, because... Jacob's not going to be around as often, and we have we have done some uh, we've put in some Palpatine esque contingency plans for what's happening. Uh, so I wanted to let everybody know what was happening for the first half of season seven of Star Wars in a Galaxy as we round out season six. Um, yeah, welcome to Star Wars uh, in a Galaxy. Watching all the Star Wars we can get our hands on. Um, I'm Eli, of course. Um, we would normally do our Bad Batch review. I'm saving that for next episode, which I actually recorded yesterday, um, which I'll announce at the end what that is, even though uh, if you follow us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter, add in a galaxy pod, you already know what it is. Um, but either way, point being, uh, so I'm going to save the Bad Batch review of episode 8 reunion for next episode. You'll hear my thoughts as well as our special guest thoughts. Um, and I guess we should just... I think we should get this ball rolling. We should get this ball rolling for um, uh, season three of Star Wars The Clone Wars. Um, so, yeah, we watched all of season three of Star Wars The Clone Wars for this season of Star Wars in a Galaxy. Um, except for Clone Cadets, which is the first episode, and Supply Lines, which is the third episode, which we watched for season one because it's fit, fit in chronologically with our chronological watch through. Um, and I guess we'll start with overall thoughts. Um, I'll guess I'll I guess I'll just I guess I'll just um, ramble on a little bit. Uh, but yeah, season three of the Clone Wars is a real step up from seasons one and two. You know, we have some we have some really strong episodes. We have some really great ones. Um, what I love most about this is the rise of the arc. You know. The rise of the three episode, the part, the episode part stories that get told with a very compelling beginning, middle, and end. You know, Mortis, the Citadel, on a grand, on a less satisfying scale, but still working is the Night Sister one with Night Sisters and Monster, and which is the Mist. You know, we have these rides of these three part stories, which is really for me where the Clone Wars shines. Um. You know, season three is is one of the uh, darker seasons. Is one of the more complex seasons. I don't. I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites. I think I'd reserve my favorites. I like six a lot. I like seven for seasons of the Clone Wars. Um, but but this is this season's in no way bad. You know, it's it's a, it's a great building on what we've seen before. It's it's the. It's the broadening of the themes. It's the uh, widening of the universe. We we have some we have some really interesting concepts and ideals um, in all parts of the galaxy. Um, yeah, um, and I will read, of course, what Jacob has to say about all this. Um, overall thoughts: It definitely feels like a bigger step from season two than season two was from season one. In a lot of it had a lot of super solid arcs, but none that were earth shattering to me. Yeah, so what Jacob says there, I, I agree, again, Star Wars and the Galaxy is often about Jacob and I having some agreements on stuff and having some disagreements on stuff. There is some more saddening stuff for me. There's some stuff that's, like, really interesting for me in this. I understand Jacob's idea that the real fun begins in um, Season 4, but really Season 5 is where things get really crazy. Um, and I understand that, and I respect that. I might not agree. Um, but, yeah, now we get to, um, we get, we're getting to, uh, one of the craziest parts, um, uh, which is we ranked all, how many is this? We ranked all 20 episodes from this season, from 20 to 1, um, 
And I'll read off both Jacob and my lists for uh, this. Yeah, so uh, at Jacob's number 20 is Evil Plans. Uh, at his number 19 is Altar of Mortis. At his number 18 is Overlords. 17, Sphere of Influence. 16, Ghosts of Mortis. 15, Witches of the Mist. 14, Night Sisters. 13, Hunt for Zero. 12, The Academy. 11, Padawan Lost. 10, Counterattack. 9, The Citadel. 8, Wookie Hunt. 7, Art Troopers. 6, Corruption. 5, Assassin. 4, Pursuit of Peace. 3, Monster, 2, Citadel Rescue, and 1, Heroes on Both Sides. Um, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead with mine. Number 20, Assassin. Number 19, Witches of the Mist. Number 18, Evil Plans. Number 17, Corruption. Number 16, Wookie Hunt. Number 15, Padawan Lost. Number 14, Night Sisters. Number 13, The Academy. Number 12, Hunt for Zero. Number 11, Heroes on Both Sides. Number 10, Pursuit of Peace. Number 9, Arc Troopers. 8, Monster. 7, The Citadel. 6, Citadel Rescue. 5, Counter Attack. 4, Sphere of Influence. 3, Altar of Mortis. 2, Ghosts of Mortis. And 1, Overlords. Yeah, so I guess I'll do a little bit of analysis on this list. Obviously, Jacob can't really tell me um, now what why he put every single thing on his list where he did. Um, I'm noticing some things. For example, Assassin's really low on my list and really high on his. I'm not exactly sure why he loves it so much. I, you know, it, is, it has that really interesting tone. It has that really, you know, there's there's some interesting... There's some interesting behind-the-scenes technique used in that that I really enjoy. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of it because... I don't know, nothing about it really felt that special. Or a sing was brought back to life, whoop de doo cool, fine. If you're into that sort of thing, I'm not gonna stop you, but it didn't really speak to me as much. Uh, yeah, the ones that it, that's most interesting to me, of course, is how low he put Mortis. He put Overlord, which is number one for my season, and number 18 out of 20. I, uh, you can hear both of our thoughts on our individual episode about the mortis arc uh called i'm pretty sure it's called the nature of the force but you know it shouldn't surprise anybody that the mortis arc is it dominates my top three it dominates them because it, it's just such a you know it's about what you're into with star wars you know what i mean it's about it's about what speaks to you in star wars it's about what you're connected to and I, I really like this mystical this, this you know the force based aspect of Star Wars the good and evil the you know what Anakin has to go through in this arc what Ahsoka has to go through in this arc what Obi-Wan has to go through in this arc is just so you know it's so fascinating and so rich with symbolism and lore that connects to not only you know the prequel trilogy but also the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy in some really interesting ways. I wouldn't be surprised if not only Ryan Johnson, but J.J. Abrams and Chris Terrio also watched Mortis in preparation for The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker with these themes of what is balance and what is what does the Force mean? How does the Force used for good and evil? and The balance between the two, all of that kind of stuff. I understand why Jacob doesn't like it. I understand that, like, you know, the idea of one person being the Force sounds ridiculous. Because it is. The idea of one person being the Force is, like, crazy. And for some people, like me, that really fascinating and deep and rich concept. And for some people, it's just ludicrous. And there's nothing wrong about either side. It's just, you know, our opinions about this stuff. Um, I, again, check out The Nature of the Force if you want to hear more of Jacob's in-depth thoughts because, you know, I, I, because I can't really elaborate them any better than he can. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really, 
it's really interesting how both of our preferences are in here. Um, he has monster significantly higher than I do. I have all the Citadel grouped together, which doesn't surprise me, and he doesn't. He seen he has Citadel Rescue higher than anything uh, from the Citadel I have on my list, and I have I have the Citadel all grouped together, which is part of the ways I like viewing a story arc because they're not. I I don't really feel like they're these separate episodes. I feel like they're the same story, and it's interesting to me that he separated them again i don't think there's anything wrong with that it's just it's just differences in opinion uh about how we view star wars and how star wars speaks to us yeah i i really adore that citadel arc it's it's a really interesting look into the adventurous side of the clone wars which i love it you know we titled that episode ahsoka tano's trial by fire Ahsoka goes through a lot of stuff in that arc, a lot of deep stuff, a lot of, a lot of earth-shattering stuff for her. Um, we see some of where Tarkin comes from. It is, it is that very, you have that very in the heat of the battle, uh, in the Clone Wars. This is a very war arc. Um, you know, somebody, I saw a post on Reddit a few months ago or something like that about, if the Clone Wars movie was the movie for the beginning of the war and the Sea of Mandalore is a movie-esque thing for the end of the war, what would the middle of the war be? And I think a strong case can be made for either Mortis or Citadel. I would per personally go with Citadel, even though I like Mortis more, because it's not about what I like more, it's about what I feel is more representative of the war. And I think going from Ahsoka not feeling like she's good enough to be Anakin's apprentice to proving in the Citadel why she's good enough to take on one of the top Separatist prisons to the Seed of Mandalore showing how far she's come with Anakin, but even without Anakin is and is a good story arc if we had to tell the story of the Clone Wars and three arcs, which we shouldn't because there's seven seasons of this great show. It's a really, but if we had to, it's a really good story arc. It's a really good way of designing these things. It, um, and I really, I really enjoy that as well. Um, which is why the Citadel is so high on here. Uh, for me, I also noticed that, uh, Sphere of Influence is fourth on my list and it's fourth from last on Jacob's list. Um, it's sphere of influence has always had a connection, a special connection to me because it's one of those fun, quirky arcs where they just go there. You know, they you don't expect them to just go there, but they just go there. They they take you to Tatooine. They take you to Mos Eisley. They do Greedo. They do Jawa's Palace. They they show us Rada for the first time since the movie. I mean, you know, what well, started as a simple trade negotiation and a blockade. Now is wait is is this is this the Phantom Menace or is this this is what I mean it has such a that Phantom Menace tone to it which I love because I love that movie um, and I love the tone that the Phantom Menace has to it and yeah the tone going off a little tangent here the Phantom Menace has is always really unique you don't see it in any of the the other Star Wars movies you know it has this playful tone it has this it has this sense that you know whole of the other Star Wars movies have this dark grandeur to them. You know, from from Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, and then, you know, you get a little bit of that playfulness in, I'd say, New Hope and uh, Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens, probably not in more sensitive movies like The Last Jedi or The Rise of Skywalker or The Empire Strikes Back. But the Phantom Menace, even though it has that dark undertone to it, you know, we have Darth Maul and his, you know, double-bladed red lightsaber, and we have the Palpatine waiting in the background for all of his schemes to happen, and, you know, these greedy, vicious Naboidians plotting behind the scenes to take over the planet of Naboo. You know, we also have pod racing, and we have Jar Jar's crazy antics, and we have Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan taking on undercover spy missions, waltzing across the planet of Naboo. We have this we have this playful tone in The Phantom Menace, and that's really replicated in Sphere of Influence. You know, we, we get this um 
look at Tatooine and we get this look at Pantora that's that's really that's really great and, and playful in a, in a good way and I, I really appreciate that um, yeah let's see what else can I notice on the list Wookie hunt for Jacobs a lot higher than than it is for me I've on our last episode of Star Wars in a Galaxy where we covered those episodes, I expressed my displeasure um, with that episode and the what I felt was copious amounts of unneeded fan service in that episode. Now I don't again I don't throw around the term of of fan service lightly. I don't. I think the idea of fan service is used a lot less than people really think it is. Uh, the, the, the idea of, we'll put it in there here because the fans will love this. Um, I think it's, I, I think it's, again, used a lot less than people will, will cry out. I, I think, but I, I do definitely feel like, you know, as I said last episode, they could have had any Wookiee. They could have had any Wookiee. They, they, you, they decided to six degrees it and use Chewbacca, which is fine. I don't hate it. I'm not in love with it, but I don't hate it. It's fine. However, I, I wonder what they could have done with a three-episode Wookiee arc. What, Trandosha arc. You know, as I was alluding to last episode. What if they... I don't know. What if they started it with the... Started Padawan Lost the same way as they did make that episode entirely how it is, um, end it with Khalifa's death, and what if they, you know, start it, started Wookiee Hunt, they, they do the same thing that they would, they'll, they, they find a Wookiee, maybe this Wookiee isn't Chewbacca, maybe it's, you know, I don't know, I'm terrible at coming up with names, and especially for Wookiees who have six W's and three Y's and all of their stuff, I'm not gonna try um, you know, we'll go with Chibaka because the Baka surname is a popular one, as we saw in, you know, the Legends days of Knights of the Old Republic and the New Jedi Order stuff. Chibaka. They find Chibaka. That's too similar. Zaybaka. Zaybaka. I'm going with Zaybaka. Uh, they find Zaybaka. They, they do the whole thing. Um... But instead of destroying the Wookiee compound, not the Wookiee compound, instead of destroying the, tr destroying the Trandoshan compound and being rescued by the Wookiees and taken back in Wookiee Hunt, um, Ahsoka gets rescued by the Wookiees and taken back to Kashyyyk, where it's learned that they're going to... The Trandoshans are, like, working with the Separatists to take over Kashyyyk, or on their own mission to take over Kashyyyk. Something that brings the battle home to Kashyyyk, and Ahsoka is forced to fight with the Wookiees uh, to defend their homeworld in return for, you know, rescuing her. Uh, and, you know, maybe Ahsoka even feels the need to stay with the Wookiees. Maybe they want her to stay as a protector of them. Maybe her Jedi skills could come in handy. Uh, maybe... Omer and Jinx from the previous episode feel like, you know, they owe a duty to the Wookiees and they stay along. But Ahsoka decides on her own to go back to Anakin and the Jedi Order because that's what she feels she needs at this moment. I think that would be a really interesting idea for that third episode. Um, but we didn't get that. And as fun as it is to talk about what we could have gotten... Um, it's also important to talk about what we got, and what we got isn't bad. I just feel like what we got is fine for an arc, but I feel like there's there would have needed to be a little bit more for an arc that is the season finale of such a tumultuous season as season three of Star Wars The Clone Wars. You know, we didn't get a revenge. We didn't get a... A lawless. That the lawless is not a scene finale. We didn't get a wrong Jedi. There we go. I keep messing that one up. Damn it. Uh, like I said last episode about the statement episodes. You know, Wookie Hunt doesn't make a statement. You know, the the third episode in my fantasized arc 
we'll call it defensive Kashyyyk. Uh, could have been a statement. Just my thought, though, uh, of course. Um, let's see. Anything else about the list before we move on? Um, I like just a little note here. I like that Jacob had the Academy at 12 and Hunt for Zero at 13, and I had the Academy at 13 and Hunt for Zero at 12. I like that little swap right there. I think it's funny. Jacob had heroes on both sides at his number one, and I had it at number 12? 11. I had it at number 11. Um, I, it's, it's interesting to see how the episode spoke to him much more than it spoke to me. I thought it was a middle-of-the-pack episode. I thought it was, I thought it was very good. I just thought, you know, it couldn't live up to the heights that Monster set, or that, you know, the Mortis Arc set, or that Spear of Influence set. Um, I guess it, it's a good standalone episode. I think it gets a little bit ruined by the effects of Pursuit of Peace, but whatever. It's, it's, it's very good. It's very, it's, it's very good. I'm not as huge of a fan as Jacob. Uh, our next part of the episode is the best episode. Uh, Jacob's is Heroes on Both Sides. Um, he says... I like Heroes on Both Sides because of the rare perspective it gives, as well as showing how the Jedi grapple with humanizing the enemy and peace versus strength. I agree with Jacob. There, there are some really cool ideas in this arc. There's some really uh, interesting questions about, you know, Lux asks Ahsoka in the episode, how many Jedi, not how many Jedi, Looks at the Soka in the episode, how many Separatists have you met, like, really met? And, you know, droids don't count. And Ahsoka can't name that many of them. A and Lux, vice versa. And it, you know, it plays into how do we treat people with ideological differences? How do we... How do we judge people who have different ideas than we do? What should be the how should we approach people who aren't bad but have views that we may find offensive or different than ours you know it's it's and and also about the separate civilian side of the war um i would also like to point out at this part of the episode um if you haven't already check out outer rim reads um, Andrew was kind enough to invite Jacob and I on for an episode where we talked about a lot of that kind of stuff about the Separatists and the Republic and how they viewed each other and what effects they had to both sides of the war. Um, we'll leave the link in the description. It came out yesterday as of when we published this episode. Um, uh, it's really great. It's awesome. Uh, Andrew was a gracious host. And we loved going on there. Uh, absolutely check that out. We talk a lot more about that there. And so if you want to listen to more of us, of Jacob and I and Andrew talking about different sides of the Clone Wars, you can definitely make sure to check that out. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll talk about Overlords um, and why I love it so much. And specifically why I think it's the best of Mortis. Um, I do think Overlord's the best. I, I, what I, one of the things I, I most love about Overlords is the tr trio of visions that Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Ahsoka get, and then that reckoning at the end of the episode. Those two, those, I guess, four moments make that episode for me. Um, you know, we see Anakin reckoning with his mother, who is not really his mother, but he thinks he's she's his mother for most of that time, and reckoning with the effects that his mother's death has had on him. Um, and we see Ahsoka grappling with what she could become, and of course we see Obi-Wan um, with Qui-Gon, and trying to understand the pain that his apprentice is going through and the danger that his apprentice could face uh 
you know, we talk a lot about in that episode, again, the nature of the Force. We talk a lot about in the nature of the Force about, we talk a lot in that episode about Obi-Wan representing the past, Ahsoka representing the future, and Anakin representing the present, as well as both of them, as he is the central focus of this arc. And we look at, you know, the visions they receive and how the visions affect them. But then we look at that reckoning at the end, with where Anakin demonstrates the true power of the Chosen One. Um, Anakin, as the present, as the arbiter of fate, is is, is asked to pick the past or the future, Obi-Wan or Ahsoka. But he can't, because of his, his greatest weakness. You know, the father tells him at the end of Ghosts of Morris, beware your heart. Why does he tell him that? Because he sees the impact that Anakin's attachments have had on him in the Overlord's episode. How Anakin cannot let go uh, and how uh, he will do great things. Not great in like, oh, that was so great. Not great in a positive way. Great as in he will do mighty things to hold on to his attachments. He, he forces the daughter and son, the avatars of light and dark to his will with the true power of the chosen one to hold on to those he holds near with a you know a zealous attachment uh you know he will kill countless of his former brothers and sisters and comrades in the jedi order because he cannot let padme go in revenge of the sith and this is, this is, you know, th this arc works best, at, in my opinion, as a great parable. What are the lessons we'll take from this? What are the lessons the characters will take from this? What, what do the characters see in themselves that will influence their actions and decisions going forward? You know, that's why, that's why Mortis speaks to me so much. Um, yeah. Worst episode for Jacob is Evil Plans. Uh, Jacob talks about it as just one of those weird adventure episodes that didn't do a whole lot and didn't feel particularly compelling. Um, I agree with Jacob. You know, it's number 18 on my list. It's number 20 on his. It's last place, of course. And, and, I, and I agree that it wasn't great. Evil Plans isn't great. Um, you know, the goofy side of the episode is, it's not my favorite, you know, it's not, it's not something I gravitate towards. Um, I will give Evil Plans a little bit of credit, though, because these are sinister undertones, uh, the stuff with Cad Bane and Toda 360, I think is very well done. Um, I will say that standing alone on, uh, as an episode, it's not as good, but in the arc, in the grand scheme of how hostage crisis happens and how hunt for zero eventually plays out i think it gains a little bit more significance um but you know i mean i think evil plans is the one that it gives us cad bane at your service i'll take on any job for the right price which is a classic line but if that's the best thing that episode can give us then we got a real problem and in my opinion i think cad bane at your service is probably the best thing that episode gives us uh just my opinion of course um, I guess I'll talk about Assassin a little bit more and why I'm not a huge fan of it. I guess... I guess it's just because I don't really... I don't really understand, just like Jacob for Evil Plans, I don't really understand Assassin's purpose. I feel like Assassin's just kind of there as another, you know, political fillery episode. Um in this arc, you know, if, if, if the arc's an album, this is that one little fillery track on there that you're not exactly sure why it's there other than to fill an extra album space. And it's not, you know, it's not a bad episode. It's not, there's nothing bad about the episode. I just don't exactly understand the purpose, you know. It, it doesn't connect really up to... And actually, it does connect up to Evil Plans, um, with Zero the Hut and stuff, but, like, you know, we get that at the 11th hour, we get that, like, within the last two minutes of the episode, and it's not really, you know, it, it, 
it plays around with some interesting narrative tools like the whole um, flashing back and forth between how Orison's going to carry out the assassination attempt and Ahsoka's visions of that. And that's cool. I'll give it that. The devices it uses is cool. I just feel like the story is only okay. It's not, it doesn't reach the heights of truly good Clone Wars storytelling, which I know is out there because this is my favorite Star Wars TV show and it's going to take a lot to oust that from its position. Uh, yeah. Let's see. What's our next um, thing? Uh, best characters uh, this season. Jacob's nominating Ahsoka Tano, Mina Von Terry, and Sai C. Teen. Um, I'm not exactly sure why he's including Sai C. Teen on this. I mean, Sai C. Teen's cool and does some cool piling stuff in this season, but I'm not hugely aware of their great Im of his great impact. Um, Mina Von Terry is a great one episode character. She only appears in that one episode, but she makes such an impact. By seeing the humanity behind somebody who believes Dooku's just just a politician. You know, as Keanu Mundi says, he's just a pol political idealist, not a murderer. Um, I mean, he ends up being wrong about that. Uh, but, you know, Mina doesn't know that. And she's she's a genuinely good person who just made a couple of bad decisions. And, yeah. And I definitely agree about Ahsoka. You know, she's the main character of the show. And she grows a lot in some interesting way. Uh this season, you know, is she with, with the Citadel, with Mortis, with all of this stuff. She she does some she has some really interesting reckonings. Um, let's see, who am I gonna say is the best some of the best characters in this season? I'll nominate the first appearance of Mother Talzin because I I'm always interested in the Night Sisters and what they bring to the table. Um I just got uh finished watching The Disappeared again in my Clone Wars rewatch personally. Uh, and I love Talzin's appearance in that. I, lo I love what Talzin's appearance in the Clone Wars offers up in terms of opportunities for further storytelling lore. Um, you know, today was that, um, the day where that Leslie Headland interview came out. And, uh, the more I hear about Leslie Headland, the more I admire her. Um, and if she includes, um, Night Sister lore in the Acolyte, I will be eternally grateful. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll include Mother Talzin in that. I'll include, um... Yeah, I mean, obviously Ahsoka I'll nominate as well. Um, this this season has some good Padme moments, I'm gonna, I gotta say, with a lot of the political content. Um, I guess we didn't include Senate Murders in our ranking. Whoops. Uh, spoilers for me, Senate Murders would probably be... Wow, where would Senate Murders be in my ranking? I think it would probably be above Evil Plan, so that would be in 17th place. Uh, it wouldn't do anything crazy, but we got some great Padme moments. We got some great, you know, uh, as said in uh, the Outer Rim Reads episode published yesterday, you know, as I talked about Padme being the ultimate enemy of Palpatine, about Padme representing this moral goodness and innocence, um, about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and not because anybody else that you're you're close with is benefiting from it. Um and Padme has some really good moments in the season, you know, talking about her speech that she gives in Pursuit of Peace, uh, talking about the speech she gives, um, in Assassin, uh, good, good Padme moments in the season. Jacob nominates the worst characters for, <laughs> I love this, R2 and 3PO, because we had to have a whole episode of ju them just running around doing nothing the whole time. That is harsh. Um, I'll say, uh, with, uh, his appearances in, uh, Sphere of Influence and Senate Murders, uh, Tandivo sucks. I hate Tandivo. Um, he seems to always pop his head in, in the wrong locations. He's never been made any point sympathetic. You know, I guess maybe you could, like, blur some lines and say he was, hey, he was a little bit sympathetic in the Scum and Villainy book, but... You know, it takes a reference book to, for us to make that character sympathetic. Really? Are you kidding me? We get the return of Zero the Hut, which is unbearable. Um, I think R2 and 3PO, I think Jacob being a little harsh on them, but that's just me. You know, in a, ser in a, in a season where we get, like, three episodes with Zero the Hut and two episodes with Tandivo, 
I think 3PO and R2 are the least of our concerns. Um, but that, again, is just me. Um, yeah. Uh, next, our next category. Coolest thing we noticed from the rewatch of the season. Uh, so Jacob talked about, um, Jacob said this, I loved how many little moments there were where we get to see Anakin's overprotectiveness and the develop and hint at his fault in the dark side. Yeah, I agree with Jacob right there. You know, that idea of Anakin's subtle fall about, you know, there's, um, there's ideas in the prequel trilogy that I don't completely agree with that Anakin's fall was too sudden. But by making the turn more subtle, by seeing his hints of darkness develop, uh, yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely think that's true. Um, I guess one of the things I've noticed more this time around um, would be, I guess, the Clone Wars has had more morally ambiguous ideals than I had previously thought about you know there are villains who aren't really villains you know they're i mean not really not really villains but like you know the wookies not the wookies the trandoshans in the uh, in the waska arc you know they're not like they're barbaric and they're brutal but that's their culture that they're just they're just doing what their culture requires them to you know the garnak is mad that ahsoka killed um killed the son. Uh, now, Ahsoka, you know, did kill him in self-defense, but, you know, he was building up Dar, his son, to be this next Trandoshan just killer. And that is so important in their society. Um, and, you know, the villains are less villainous than I had previously thought. The heroes can sometimes be less heroic. Anakin straight up turns to the dark side and goes to Morse before his memory is erased because... We can't have him know what happens to him in the future because that would mess with a lot of galactic implications. Um, you know, you know, Greedo wasn't a bad guy because he was hired for a job to make ends meet to kidnap the chairman of Pantora's daughters. You know, that, like, Tarkin arguably could be just trying to support his republic and be patriotic, even if you know, he is a bad person and a lot of the ideas he's suggesting seem utterly barbaric and just dark side influenced. And we know they, they are because dark, because Tarkin's a ruthless person. But the, the sense of people, people aren't pure good or pure bad. There's some, there's some more complicated things going on here. Um, Jacob uh, nominated his favorite planet for, for Toydaria. Um, appearing, of course, in, which is the mist. Uh, I love the spire rising above the green swamp and the whole design of the Toydarian architecture, how it was uh, adapted for them as flyers was really neat. I agree, Toydaria is a really interesting and unique planet um, in a, in an arc of, ver in a season of very interesting planets, Toydaria definitely does stand out. I would nominate, indeed, my, one of my favorite planets um, for Dothamir seen in Night Sisters and seen in Monster um, and seen in Witch of the Mist, you know, it's a, it is a, it is a, one, it is one of those natural dark side planets. It's not, it's not like, it's not planet, it's not a planet where dark side people just appear like Tatooine or like a, you know, a Coruscant. It's one of those spiritually dark side planets like Exegol. Like Korriban, like, you know, in Legends, we'd have, like, Droman Kass and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's, but it's not, you know, it, unlike Exegol, which, it, or Korriban, which are these Sith homeworlds, this is the homeworld of, uh, a dark side force-using species that's a little different than the Sith. They're less combative, they're more spiritual, um, the Night Sisters and the whole mystery of Dothamir really make that arc for me, um, and, you know, seeing the interesting ways that Dothmere constructs itself, the world building is brilliant, I think it's probably enhanced by 
how we go to Dolphinir in Jedi Fallen Order. But, you know, Jedi Fallen Order couldn't have developed Dolphinir without the Knight Sisters doing it previously. Um, and this season doing it previously. And I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. I think that's it for the regular portion of our episode. Instead of uh, a one chord portion, I'll say it just because I like to. What you brought me today is worth one quarter portion. Good stuff. Either way, instead of doing that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future of Star Wars in a Galaxy for the coming um, weeks and months. Um, so, what's going to happen is Jacob and I, over the past few months, have pre-recorded four episodes of the first four arcs of season four of Star Wars The Clone Wars, Mon Calamari, the Shadow Warrior and Droid stuff, Umbara and Zygeria. Um, and in addition to that, we will also be having um, three th theme between themes episodes in there, all with special guests, which I will be recording more in real time, um, and yeah, there will be, so, uh, as announced, uh, on Twitter earlier, the second one is going to be on the topic of throne room scenes, um, with the great Devor of a large view of the Force, he's returning, we recorded that episode very recently, it is a banger, it is a certified banger, uh, it's going to be great. That's going to be next week. Um, is going to be Throne Rooms with Devor. Um, we'll be looking at three Throne Room scenes. The Throne Room scene from Phantom Apprentice on Mandalore. The Throne Room scene from Return of the Jedi on the second Death Star. And the Throne Room scene from The Rise of Skywalker on Exegol. Um, really good stuff there. Really, I love that episode. It was It's a good one, and I hope everyone will enjoy it as well. Um, I have plans for the other two theme between themes, they're going to be good. Um, Star Wars in the Galaxy will be resuming its more normal schedule um, in mid-August. There will be a week break in there. It'll probably be in mid-July between our third theme between themes and posting of the other pre-records. Uh, so there will be a little bit of a one-week break in there, but we're trying to provide a more regular schedule for in a Galaxy uh, this summer, even as Jacob and I will be less available, but going into the fall, we'll resume on our normal schedule, we'll finish um, Season 7 of Star Wars and Galaxy, Season 4 of The Clone Wars, and then we'll get into uh, Season 5 and 6 and 7, which are going to be shorter because they're, they're shorter seasons, they're more condensed into clearly solid arcs instead of just, oh yeah, here's a couple standalone episodes, so that's what we're going to be... Um, doing in that realm uh yeah as i mentioned before um please go check out our um appearance uh on um outer rim reads andrew um kindly invited us on there it was a really it's a really great episode it's a really um i we loved recording it uh we loved recording with andrew again it was I cannot praise it enough. It was really a great time. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, I guess in the meantime, uh, thanks for listening to this episode of Star Wars in the Galaxy. Um, you can listen to us. You can find all of our previous episodes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, wherever you listen to your podcast. We will probably be there. If we're not, let us know. Um, follow us at in a galaxy pod on Twitter. We'll, we tweet a lot, so you'll find our opinions and stuff and news announcements for in a galaxy on Twitter. Um, Instagram at Star Wars in a Galaxy. Um, email us swinagalaxy at gmail dot com. We love hearing from listeners. Um, send us your questions and hot takes and six degrees of Star Wars and all that. We really do appreciate it. Um, leave a five star rating and review. Um, if you are on a podcast app that allows you to do that, um, it really does help with our visibility. Um, and until next time, may the force be with you always. Thank you so much for listening to season six of Star Wars in a Galaxy.
We'll see you in season seven.